This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, everybody, and it's so good to see such a big uh, audience. Uh, we all know that the evolution of human nutrition is a, an extremely popular topic. And our, our logo actually comes from a street artist named Banksy, who's extremely well known for his graffiti. And it really uh, re reflects the popular concern for our uh, condition in the world today. Uh, the, the, this was on the front cover, cover of The Economist a few years ago. And it actually uh, reflects the uh, situation where we have rising uh, percentages of obesity and uh, overweight in the world. And we, we, we find that this has spawned a whole uh, interest and, in fact, an industry in healthy eating and a healthy diet. And as part of this, is an interest in the paleo diet. I mean, it's so easy, a caveman can do it. And what the paleo diet people say that will solve basically the problems of obesity and obesity-related uh, illnesses by eating like our caveman ancestors. Now, if you stop and uh, th think about this a bit, uh, a lot of it is what's in the popular consciousness about what a caveman was and what a caveman diet is. And when Ma Margaret and I were uh, planning this meeting about two years ago, there, there was an article in the New York Times about cavemen in the city. And it was subtitled, uh, Ancestor Envy. And there, there, there's a group of people in New York who are trying to live in New York City as cavemen, eating raw food. Uh, they exercise by jumping over park benches and running and throwing stones back and forth. And uh, also, they give blood regularly. Because the, the idea is, is that cavemen were in accidents a lot and bled a lot. So if you're going to be healthy, you need to give blood. Now, we, we, we can sort of laugh at this. But it's a very serious thing about trying to live a healthy life in our world uh, today. Uh, there, 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 there's also a more popular side of this. You can buy caveman cookies that are supposed to be made with ingredients that would have been available to our caveman ancestors. Now, if we stop and think about the, this a bit, and an Alex Gregory cartoon from The New Yorker uh, basically says something's just not right here. Because we're living healthy, breathing clean air, eating wonderful food, but we still die at 30 years old. Now, at the, it's not so much this that I think bothers the uh, average paleoanthropologist in relation to the popular conception of what a caveman diet is. Because we actually don't really have one caveman diet. If we, you look at the human record today, the fossil evidence goes back almost seven mi mi million years. There's a lot of caveman time there. And if you think about the distribution around the world, uh, for the first, what it is at five mi million years, four or five million years, our ancestors were in Africa, but they were spread through a variety of habitats from woodland to forest to more open country. And then about two, two million uh, y years ago, you had this migration out of Africa through India into Southeast Asia. 
uh, you had the more recent uh, migration of anatomically modern Homo sapiens, say around 50,000 years ago or so. Our ancestors were off, uh, occupying a number of different ha habitats and also eating a number of different kinds of food. So our <laughs> earliest ancestors were probably eating diets very similar to modern non-human primates. But as we come up through the record, we have uh, some a a evidence of aquatic wetland resources, uh, tubers, of course meat, possibly the use of fire, uh, large ga game animals, seeds, a variety of different diets. And when you think about it, uh, it's actually a luxury of the modern world to be able to pick and choose your, your diet. Because if nothing else, our caveman ancestors were uh, very, um, uh, they, they were generous. They, they, they were very adept at adapting to the diet they had. And uh, this is probably what one of the hall hallmarks of our species. With this, though, anthropologists have used diet in many different hypotheses and many different ways to uh, help to explain and uh, help us understand the course of uh, evolution. If, if we go back to the 1950s, we had a very different picture of what human evolution was. We th thought our ancestors split off uh, maybe 15, 16 million years ago from the line leading to our closest uh, re re relatives. And we had very many fewer players in the human evolutionary puzzle. And I in the 1950s, John R Robinson put forward the dietary uh, hypothesis for human evolution. At this time, the only fossils we had came from South Africa. And uh, these were Australopithecus robustus, and Australopithecus africanus. At that point, the robustus, the heavy-jawed ones, were thought to be the ancestral species, with africanus branching off and le le leading to homo. And there was a dietary explanation for this. The, ro the robust Australopithecines were thought to be primarily ve vegetarians. Uh, the africanus were incipient omnivores, meat eaters. And you had a feedback mechanism where the more meat you ate, the more tools you, you used, the larger your brain became, and ultimately you became anatomically modern Homo sapiens. By the time we get into the mid-1960s, Lewis and Mary Leakey had made their discoveries at Olduvai Gorge. You had Zygenthropus boisei, the big nutcracker man. Uh, you also had ho Homo habilis. And the, the, the number of players changed a bit. You dropped down with Africanus being slightly older in time. Very importantly here also, there was Ramapithecus, who at 14 million years ago was supposed to be the first hominid. And anybody in my generation believed in Ramapithecus. That's all there was of it, just a small jaw. And you had the reconstruction of this bipedal hominid. The argument, as we remember, was if you had a small canine tooth, you couldn't defend yourself. You had to use tools. If you used tools, you had to stand upright. If you were using tools standing upright, you, your brain was evolving. And it was a straight line up to Homo with nothing in between. But the important thing was you had this feedback mechanism going that was centered around this dietary uh, idea of more meat, more tool use, larger brain size, bingo humans. In 1970, Jolly came up with the seed-eating hypothesis in the Journal of the Royal Anthropological Association, which at that point was called Man. Uh, Jolly's seed-eating paper was the most highly cited paper in that journal for over a decade. And the reason was, is with another dietary hypothesis, he uh, gave an initial kick to this feedback system. And by c comparing the dentition of hominids to the dentition of baboons and uh, a large species of extinct baboon called Therapithecus. Uh, what he put forward was that the small canines actually came from eating seeds and using your mouth as a grinding uh, organ. And uh, that through this dietary change, you were setting the stage with the small canine. But then you still had the problem of not being able to defend yourself. So throughout the 1970s, you still had this feedback system going. 
Okay, now bringing this up to, to, to the modern day, the picture, of course, has become much more complicated. Ramathithicus has been re relegated to a pre-hominid status. And we have a very complicated roadmap. But diet still plays a very important part in how we try to understand the course of human evolution. Yeah, what, but what we use now is a combination of the diet with the context of e evolution on the far side of the picture there. You have a, uh, or it's the oxygen isotope tra uh, trace showing a shift in the climate from warmer to a drier climate and also an increase in variation. We also have a uh, trace here where we have the increase in cranial capacity. And this period of about uh, 2 million to 1.5 million years ago, where the climate is changing, the brains are expanding. And you have what we seem to, to see as a radical change in the morphology of our early ancestors. You have Australopithecus, as represented by Lucy, dating about 3 million years ago. You have the Nariokotomi boy, a virtually complete skeleton of a Homo erectus, dating about 1.7, 1.8 million years ago. Now, uh, in the, 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 the 1980s and into the 1990s, these were the epitome of the two main types of humans, the Australopithecines and the Homo, large brain size and Homo, long legs, very elongated body. And very importantly, you have uh, evidence of meat eating and a change of diet uh, at this time period as well. Now, what, what, one of my favorite pieces of evidence for the introduction of uh, more animal-based food into the diet at this period are tapeworms. And in 2001, there was a very interesting paper that came out that showed the closest relative to human tapeworms are tapeworms found in African wild dogs. And what this su su suggests is that there was some su su situation in Africa in about this time period that but put humans in contact with the tapeworms from wild dogs. Okay, now what, what, what's interesting about this is if we look at uh, more modern research on the evolution of human diet, we're branching out from rather simplistic um, assumptions to using broader comparative uh, data sets. And th this is one that was very influential to my thinking in the 1990s. You, you have at the far picture body weight and basal me metabolic rate. The little black dot there with the red circle is humans. We have the basal metabolic rate you, you would expect of an animal of our body size. Uh, the close figure here is body weight against brain weight. Humans, of course, have a relatively large brain size for our body weight. The question was, where did we get the energy to fuel this large brain? Because brains are extremely expensive in metabolic terms, uh, you would expect our metabolic rate to be uh, 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 elevated to about the same degree. You see the size elevation here. In 1995, Peter Wheeler and I put forward the expensive tissue hypothesis. And this was a, a very simple thing where we were looking for that missing basal me metabolic rate. And what we found that was that with the expensive tissues uh, of the body, the only thing that was relatively small was the guts. And uh, they were small enough to almost perfectly balance off the size of the increased brain size. And so what our uh, conclusion was in the mid-1990s is that ancestral humans had to make a change to a high quality diet to allow us to evolve a large brain size. It was no more complicated uh, than that. You can't have small guts if you don't have a uh, easy to di di digest food source. And uh, what was also uh, fun about this is that it had a number of follow on implications. Uh, in terms of the early period of migration about two million years ago, meat from one animal is pretty similar to meat from another animal, bone marrow, whatever. Uh, it would solve some of the problems of moving into different environments as you spread throughout the world. 
but more importantly, is what do you do with the kids? Because if you're e eating high quality animal based food, it's, a dang it's dangerous to go out and hunt. It takes knowledge, it takes strength, it takes sophistication. You're going to have to have, engage in a lot of food sharing. The set center picture, I always think of her when I'm having a hard day. I, I have a picture of her in my office. And what she epitomizes there is what a woman does. If she's having to feed the infant, she's probably pregnant, she's also nursing. Her own me me metabolic budget is going to go way up. And how is she going to do it? How is she going to get enough food to support herself and her dependents? And you come very easily into an argument that you have to have a whole change in your stru social structure, cooperation, uh, economic division of labor, and this type of thing. And it, it all comes off of this reasoning about a high quality diet. Now, th this was almost 20 years ago, and things change. Uh, that model was based on a zero sum model, saying that we probably didn't have an in increase in the daily energy budget of our early ancestors. And that probably isn't true now. Uh, you ha have, uh, from a, a, a number of sources, what looks like a positive relationship between ba basal metabolic rate and brain weight as you look at large groups of mammal species. I want to draw your attention here to the green dots uh, uh, up at the top, which are the primates. And work that shows that primates tend to have a lower muscle mass than uh, non-primate mammals. And what you probably have here is a payoff in the energetic cost of movement and locomotion in primates that helps balance the expense of the relatively large brain we see in, across the, the primates. Uh, th there's also a very interesting paper that came out in Nature last de December by Navaretta, Von Scheich, and Eisler on ener energetics and the evolution of human brain size. They, over the years, had collected a fantastic da da data set where they were able for hundreds of mammalian individuals to get fat-free mass. And what they found by doing the regressions with fat-free mass instead of total uh, body mass that we'd used is that there was really no payoff of gut size and brain size across all, all of the mammals, or even within the primates. But what they did find that was very surprising is that there was a strong negative relationship between brain size and adipose tissue. So you out there had large brains and were very skinny, or you were very fat in terms of adipose tissue and had relatively small brain size across all, all of the mammals. And what their explanation for this was is these are your two safety nets if you're a mammal. Uh, you can use your brain to give yourself a generalist type of ad adaptation. Or you can carry around your reserves for a hard time as fat. And what, what their ar argument was, was that humans had actually bucked this relationship. That we have both the generalized large brain size, but we also have the adipose tissue. So we basically have two insurance policies here. Uh, and and that, that they've also uh, de developed a model in terms of diet and all of the other trade-offs that you can have when you're uh, trying to balance your e energy budget. You can have high quality food. You can have cooperation and um, sort of your, 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 your safety net with groups of people. Uh, you can cut down your locomotion costs, cut down production and growth and re reproduction. So uh, as we're go go going through uh, the talks uh, today, what I what want you, you to think about is all of the different possibilities that we can have in terms of balancing our uh, uh, energy re relationships. And uh, that whenever we're talking about diet, as we go through the uh, uh, evolutionary period, Think about how your energy budget, budget relates to your growth and development, relates to your social re relationships, the amount of fat you're carrying around, whether you're storing food, because it all comes to, to together in a big package like this. So we're, we're going to have a, a very 
fun time uh, t today going through the entire fossil record. And I'd like to thank Carter for giving us a chance to do this. Okay, thanks to the organizers for a great opportunity to share ideas and catch up with the latest in the field. So we've just been um, hearing one kind of approach um, which is um, based on the hard evidence. And what I want to do is to give uh, another kind of approach to this problem that amazingly we still haven't really sorted out, which is that compared to other animals, we have a problem in identifying this key feature of what it is that characterizes the biology of the species. So if you want to understand a flea, then think about the fact that it survives by eating blood and dolphins on fish and giraffes on tree leaves. So what is the fundamental diet of humans? And I want to suggest that um, we get away from some of the traditional thinking to some extent. So traditional thinking, I think of as including these components, so uh, that a really important part of the diet is um, meat, or, or more generally, uh, stuff that comes from animals. Uh, it can be some invertebrates. Um, another uh, very popular approach is to think about the fact uh, that you have an increase in variability of the human diet. I actually think in some ways that's right, and in other ways it's wrong. And then uh, there's the question of how much benefit could our ancestors have got by processing their food without fire, by using the, the growing lithic technology to be able to chop and pound and open their foods. Those, I'm sure, all got their importance. Uh, I want to focus on this last one, which is the idea that uh, cooking, and more generally, the control of fire, has been hugely important in enabling us to conquer the world and even to survive in Africa for hundreds of thousands of years before we conquered the world. So in order to set this up, let me remind you what others have said, which is that energy does seem to be a key goal of feeding. In fact, in many ways, you can regard life as a system by which things find energy and use it to make more of themselves. This is a typical little graph coming from uh, our own studies of chimpanzees in, in Uganda, but it could be uh, one that applies to all sorts of different studies, where what you see is that as a slightly better food intake is obtained, in this case because of seasonal variation or where a female just happens to live, then you get a big effect in terms of reproduction. So 5% more ripe fruit in the diet, and your interbirth interval is four months shorter. This is the sharp edge of where evolution is acting. A little bit more energy, you get higher genetic fitness. Okay, so we heard from Alyssa Crittenden that uh, the diet of the Hadza hunter-gatherers is diverse, but that the main features are starchy foods, meat, and honey. What I want to suggest is that each of these, in very important ways, depends on the control of fire for human ability to use them. Now, it is certainly the case, and it's been known for uh, something like 150 years, that if you survey all of the peoples in the world, you find that everybody cooks their food on a very regular basis. It's very difficult to find any cases where anybody has gone as many as 24 hours without cooking. And the generalization that I found is that the evening meal is a routine cooked thing. So you find that there are some foods that are eaten raw, and, and very often what these are are foods that are eaten while hunters and gatherers are out looking for food. And in some cases, it's just difficult to whip up a fire, for instance, if you are an Inuit out on the ice. But when they get back home, they really want to have their food cooked. And the other perspective I want to bring to this is that contemporaneously, it is very difficult to find evidence of people being able to thrive on raw food. Now, this might surprise you, because some of you might be raw foodists, and some of you might know raw foodists. But look at uh, the data here. On the right-hand side, what you see is uh, data for uh, raw foodists, um, with uh, the best data being these ones, uh, a study of 572 
German raw foodists, and as they increase their intake of raw food, so their body mass index, shown on this axis, declined. That is the height divided by the weight squared. And uh, all of the raw foodists have got a low body mass index compared to those eating their food cooked. You might be saying, well, what about the meat aspect? Well, uh, if we look at those who eat their food cooked, it is true that those who are eating their uh, food with meat do have a somewhat higher body mass index than those who've been vegetarian for a number of years. But um, even uh, raw foodists do eat some meat, and uh, we can look at the effect of this on uh, their body mass index, and we find that there is no difference among the raw foodists in the effect of, in the presence of meat in their diet as to their body mass index. So what we're seeing here is that, yeah, meat eating helps a little bit, but not nearly as much as cooking your food. Okay, well, um, nevertheless, could, uh, could humans uh, do well? They might just be a bit thin. Well, think about this. Uh, every animal that we know of, other than humans, eats their food raw every day, of course, uh, like chimpanzees, and they produce babies uh, eating uh, those raw foods. What about humans? Here are the data from that German study. And in the German study, what we see is that as the amount of uh, food eaten raw increases up to 100%. 50% of women by that point are amenorrheic. Their menstrual cycles have closed down altogether. And this appears to be because they are short of energy. And another 20% had subfecund cycles. Now the remarkable thing about this is that we're dealing with a population here that is doing incredible things to their foods. They're going, using electric processors to blend and grind and uh, sometimes even dry their foods up to 114 degrees, uh, which is the legitimate uh, temperature if you're a raw foodist. Um, remember, they're using domesticated food, which is much less fiber, um, much less uh, toxins, much higher levels of digestible carbohydrates than uh, the wild foods. Uh, they are including some meat. They sometimes uh, include a fair amount of oil, which is not too natural. They're eating from the, the global food resource. So there's never a point at which there is any shortage of food supplies for them. They can eat from the tropics if the temperate regions are not doing well. And, uh, and of course, they have relatively low activity compared to most hunters and gatherers. And yet, the average woman cannot have a baby. This seems to me to say that if a woman was trying to eat raw food in the wild, then many more than the average woman would not be able to have a baby, and therefore that our species is different from every other because we are adapted to eating cooked food. We need it. Why? So I'm going to go through quickly the three elements of the food supply, uh, starch, meat, and honey, that Alyssa recognizes as being very important for the Hadza. Now, with starch, we have known for some time that if you cook starch, then it becomes more easily digested. And this graph from 1981 is an example of that, where if people were fed cooked cornstarch versus raw cornstarch, you could see the effect on the change in glucose levels in the blood. They also compared what happens if you actually eat glucose. Well, eating cooked cornstarch has a rise in glucose that is very similar to the effect of eating glucose. So it's very easily digested. The raw cornstarch is not. So this is the difference between a high glycemic food, the cooked, and a low glycemic food, the raw. But the question is, and people often uh, continue to debate this question, uh, is it possible that all this is showing is how quickly the digestion happens? And that in the end, if you followed this curve along for several more hours, that the raw cornstarch would eventually all produce glucose in the blood, and so it would just be a wash. There'd be no difference. So the question is, what happens to the raw starch? OK, now, here we have a problem. When uh, my colleagues and I first produced a paper about this uh, in 1999, we were told by some people that the, our idea that cooked starch was more productive of energy than raw was probably wrong, because the raw starch is, in, in the end, fermented in the large intestine the microbiome produces short-chain fatty acids from long-chain carbohydrates in the colon. Okay, well, how important is that? The only way to get at this 
is to understand the difference between fecal digestibility, which is how much of the food is remaining after you look in the feces, compared to ileal digestibility. And the reason is that different digestive processes happen in the small and the large intestine. The way to get an ileal digestibility, the digestibility by the end of the small intestine, is to take advantage of people who, for some medical misfortune, have lost their large intestine. And then the small intestine, the ileum, is brought to the surface of the abdomen and is emptied into a bag, a stoma. So these ileostomy patients allow researchers to see what has happened to food that they've eaten by the time it has gone completely through the small intestine. And this leads to the following data. These, I think, are the entire data set of what we know about the ileal digestibility of human-eaten starch. And what you see, for example, is uh, with the green banana, that if the food is eaten raw, then in the ileostomy patients, you find that only 47% of it has been digested. 53% comes through undigested to the end of the small intestine. Whereas if it's cooked, 99% comes through, 99% uh, uh, is digested, and um, only 1.2% comes through. So this is, these are big differences. Now what do we make of these? Well, now the problem is the food that goes into the large intestine, what happens to it? We don't know. You might find that there's nothing left when you look in the feces. OK, it's all been fermented, broken down by the bacteria. But how many of those short-chain fatty acids cross the gut wall to be used by us, and how many remain with the bacteria to be used only by the bacteria? The current estimate is 50%. Anything where the estimate is 50% means you just don't know. But there is a bit of logic behind the 50%. So if we say the 50%, then this leads to a median 32, 30% increase in digestibility of the carbohydrates as, as a result of being eaten cooked compared to raw. And uh, recently, um, in our lab, uh, Rachel Carmody has led the first experiment to find out in a mammal what is the effect on net energy gain of eating your food cooked. And this is what she finds. Uh, comparing the effects of eating um, cooked or pounded. So these sweet potatoes are eaten raw and whole. These are eaten raw and pounded. These are eaten cooked and whole. And these are eaten cooked and pounded. And you see the difference. When they're cooked, then they maintain body weight. When they're raw, they don't. Cooked starch gave these mice more energy than when it was eaten raw. So that's starch. What about meat? She did the same experiment with meat with the same results. The mice eating cooked flourished. The mice eating raw did much more poorly. You might think it's incredibly artificial, and it sort of is. But um, mice can live on meat for quite a long time. And there are disgusting accounts of mice getting into the bodies of nestling albatrosses in the South Atlantic, where they live for some time. They kind of make a, a hole in there and nest in there and, and eat them for uh, several days. Why is it that cooking meat should be a good thing? And you see, look at the textbooks. You often find it's a bad thing for energy because there are dripping losses. OK, well, you can try and minimize the dripping losses. But the basic reason seems to be that uh, there is going to be denaturation. So here what we see is, I think, the only experiment where we have some evidence about the digestibility of a protein uh, raw and cooked. And again, we're using ileostomy patients. In the case of the starches, you can actually look microscopically and see the presence of the starch grains. Here what you're doing is looking for uh, isotopically labeled eggs. And um, so the eggs have been laid by isotopically labeled chickens. And uh, what you find is uh, this big difference between raw and cooked. There's a cunning way of using healthy volunteers to mimic the uh, result. Still small samples, but still you see the overall impact. It looks pretty big. And here, as far as I think it's fair to say the latest data show, uh, we can use this as a direct readout of the increase in energy because the proteins that go into the large intestine do not have energetic significance for the body. Now again, there's a little bit of debate about this, and it may turn out that there is some, in which case we'll have to change these figures. But anyway, they're not much help for meat because they use eggs. And uh, no one has yet done a meat experiment where we can see directly the effect of cooking on 
the bioavailability, digestibility of the protein. But another uh, effect does look important too, and that is that one of the effects of cooking is to uh, increase the softness of the food. Many of you will be better cooks than I. In fact, all of you will be better cooks than I am probably. Uh, and, and you will know that one of the aims of the cook, according to Mrs. Beaton and many other great cook uh, authorities, is to soften the food. And think about your Thanksgiving dinners. It's all incredibly soft. It, it does this uh, routinely with all foods. And softer food is easier for the body to digest. The body works less hard to break it down into the point where uh, it can be acted on physically. So we have done an experiment, again led by uh, Rachel Carmody, in which uh, we've used open flow respirometry with rats uh, sitting in their little uh, tubes on force plates to measure their uh, activities and work out how much energy is spent by a rat in digesting its food. In hunters and gatherers, you routinely find that they treat meat like we treat hamburgers. You both cook it and you physically reduce it. So I conclude that cooked meat gives more energy than raw meat. The third of our categories is honey. And here we have a different phenomenon in play because honey is normally eaten raw. But I think it's just really striking that you can do experiments in captivity with the great apes, and one of the easiest way to get them to behave in the way you want is by rewarding them with honey. They will work very hard to get honey. And in the wild, they love honey. And here is the amount of honey eating that we have now got data on from apes in the wild compared to hunters and gatherers. Savannah people here, and here are forest people, the F.A. pygmies of the Congo. And so you see here the numbers. Trivial amounts of honey eaten by the great apes. So what is going on? People use fire. So the use of smoke seems hugely important for them to be able to get this honey, which is an important part of the total caloric intake over the year. And seasonally, can be very important. It can be the dominant caloric source for a month or two at a time in all of the hunters and gatherers in Africa that have been looked at, which is something like uh, in eight or nine groups. And there is this fascinating relationship with uh, honey guides. Here is indicator, indicator. And uh, this is the species that flutters in front of people, taking them to honey and reducing the amount of time that they spend looking for honey. In a study in Kenya, the amount of time spent finding honey was reduced from, on average, eight hours to three hours, so saving a lot of hours per day among the Boran people. So they, they lead people to honey. They, they get uh, some benefit from it uh, in the end. There seems to be an unlearned guiding behavior because they are brood parasites. They're like cuckoos. They, they are laying their eggs in the nests of other birds so the young ones do not see their mothers and fathers. So they have to uh, produce this behavior without any opportunity to mimic uh, their, uh, to learn from their parents. And that suggests that this is evolutionarily significant, and it looks like an ancient mutualism because there is no other species. Contra your r rumors that honey badgers might do this. Uh, there is no other species that has been shown to do this on a regular basis. So I like the idea that this is a, an evolved cooperation uh, indicating an ancient use of fire, and by the way, it indicates what people very often tend to deny, which is that humans uh, might be well adapted to intermittent high glycemic loads. So in summary, I think there are these four uh, big effects. I haven't been able to refer to the fourth here, but cooked starch gives lots of energy. Cooked meat gives lots of energy, but we don't know how much yet. Uh, fire gives a huge increase in the amount of honey. And um, if I had more time, I would note that four hours a day or more is saved in chewing by uh, eating your food cooked. And that means that you can go off and do other interesting things like hunting. So I'm not suggesting these other aspects aren't important, but I do think that this suggests that humans can be thought of as adapted to eating cooked food and that uh, the control of fire, therefore, the question of when it arose in human evolution is, uh, is hugely fascinating. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. 
I'm actually a little bit new to this field. This is a little outside of what I've done for most of my research career. So I think I can be a little unbiased when I say that what we know about nutrition and human evolution is a huge scientific success story written largely by the people you're going to hear from here today. We'd like to suggest that there is a missing piece that could be really important. And we think that that missing piece has to do with microbial contributions to host health, nutrition, and evolution. What we're mainly interested in are bacteria, including archaea, viruses, and tiny eukaryotes that are organized into microbiomes, or communities of microorganisms living in close association with hosts. And when I talk about hosts, I'm going to be referring uh, really just to primates in this particular talk. Now, what is the problem that we're interested in? Um, undoubtedly, we've all been told that, uh, resist that fiber is really good for us, and that is actually true. Even though resistant fibers are good for us, our bodies actually delegate dealing with them to the gastrointestinal or GI microbiome. So our overall question is how important is the GI microbiome in human evolution? Now this slide should give us a little bit of insight into the problem that we're dealing with. Uh, food enters the intestinal tract um, here and then passes into the small intestine. Now, in the small intestine, most of the digestion that occurs is, um, is provided or is, is undertaken by enzymes that our body produces. So the nutrients that we break down and absorb at this part of the gut are largely driven by the machinery that we produce and uh, deploy in, in service of that problem. By the time that food hits the large intestine, what's left are materials that our body really can't do much with. These are primarily resistant fibers and starches. And at this point, we give it over to uh, the microbiome, to the microorganisms, primarily bacteria, that conduct metabolic functions on our uh, behalfs. We're most excited by the fact that this is where our data comes from, um, <laughs> down here. Now, uh, we think that microbiomes bring good things to life. Uh, microbes supply about 6 to 10 percent of our daily energy supply. We think this is important, and our models of human evolution and thinking about nutrition need to account for what's probably a pretty substantial uh, proportion of our daily energy supply. They also produce short-chain fatty acids. Now, these are extremely important um, energy sources. They actually supply nutrients that are directed um, directly to the intestinal lining. So the cells of the inside of our large intestine don't actually receive a blood supply. They're on the microbes' energetic ledger. So again, thinking about expensive tissues, we're actually removing these particular tissues from our budget. We're extremely interested in the fact that microbes produce hormones and vitamins, and of these, B vitamins might be very, very important, including folate, B6, and B12, and I'll touch on that just a little bit. Um, later, but these are very important vitamins in terms of brain development. They also affect obesity and appetite control. So some of the ideas that we have about fat uh, probably at this point now need to involve the microbiome, uh, gastrointestinal microbiome. This gives a brief overview of what actually happens in the large intestine. As I noted, we're presented with resistant fibers and starches. Uh, microbes uh, begin breaking this down and removing sugars from those substances and then um, conducting a fermentation uh, process here. Now that's what's most important because it produces the short-chain fatty acids. There are secondary products that find their way into being short-chain fatty acids as well, uh, as well as waste products that are produced via this process. So the host has to manage not only production of things that are very, very good for it, it has to, pro it has to process, or the microbiome has to process the waste products from this particular process. And then if everything works the way it should, those uh, substances are passed into the blood supply to assist with host energy balances. Now, why do we think that knowing about microbiomes in human evolution is important? I think we need to, uh, we would argue that uh, we really can't ignore the nutrients that derive from this source. So we know a lot about teeth, we know a lot about um, soft tissues, muscles, and so on. Um, we think it's very important to think about the nutrients that come from this process they may well add up uh, to be quite significant. They also impact many tissues, as is shown here uh, from a recent paper that draws some kind of correlate between um, what happens in the microbiome, the gut microbiome, and other tissues in the body. Experimental results are also very interesting in this regard. This is a fat mouse, in case you can't tell, and this is a not fat mouse over here. Now, the main difference between these uh, mice is that they've been implanted with the microbiome from an obese individual, I'll let you guess which one, uh, and a lean individual. 
These are sterile or notobiotic or germ-free mice that have been implanted with microbiomes from human individuals, and you can see a, a rather dramatic phenotypic uh, result from this. Anytime fat's involved, we're interested um, for many reasons, um, and uh, because it suggests something about metabolism and energy balances. The sheer scale of these interactions is also really important to us. There are trillions of microbes in us, on us, and around us at this moment, um, conducting uh, a, a range of uh, functions. So the sheer scale alone, we think, makes this interesting in the context of human evolution. Microbial products promote brain growth through the B vitamins that I talked about. They impact longevity because short-chain fatty acids are, in fact, cancer inhibitors. So there may be uh, some link here with longevity. So we are asking whether or not they have brain growth uh, roles or roles in the evolution of longevity. As we'll learn a little bit more today, some of our, our ancestors ate very, very high fiber diets. And so one question that we're very interested in is whether or not our ancestors had to negotiate new relationships um, with microbes or arrangements. There's a possibility that our microbiomes were effectively liberated, or we were liberated from our microbiomes because of the changes that occur when we cook. Finally, we might ask whether or not we were occupied by novel mi microbes that could confer different kinds of advantages to us as hosts. Uh, so what are we doing about all of this? Uh, we're conducting comparative analyses of primate gastrointestinal microbiomes, or what I'll call GI microbiomes. We're analyzing bacterial DNA from fecal samples from both wild and captive primate populations uh, to understand these microbiomes. How are we doing this? Our study breaks into two uh, major parts. The first part is taxonomy, and in, in essence, looking at the structure of the microbiome. What, who's there? What, how is it structured? How are the bacteria in the microbiome related to one another, and do those differ across primate species? We're taking advantage of new, um, uh, very new sequencing technologies that generate um, incredible quantities of data, and we're actually taking advantage of um, 16S uh, RNA molecule, which is very conservative in bacteria and allows us to make statements about bacterial uh, taxonomy, running it through various pipelines to get to the point of st statistics and interpretation. So the first part of our project is really taxonomic. The second part is what's called metagenomic or functional. Here we're trying to figure out what the genes that come with the microbes are actually doing. So we're saying, what's the taxonomy, what's the, what's the structure of the ecosystem, and we're asking, what does that ecosystem um, do, and again, using various sequencing technologies to get to that. What are we finding? We're finding some very interesting results with our cross-species comparison, so I'm going to give kind of a limited view of those um, here today. Uh, one thing we seem to be finding is integration between diets and microbiomes, and the example that I'm showing here uh, is from black howler monkeys or Alouatta pigra. This is an endangered species that occupies the Yucatan Peninsula. The population has been under investigation by Dr. Alejandro Estrada for many years, um, and these results were generated by uh, one of our brilliant graduate students, uh, Ms. Katie Amato. Now, it's slightly complicated, so let me uh, walk you through it. We have different habitats, including a continuous rainforest, a semi-deciduous habitat, a rainforest fragment, and captivity. And what we're finding is that rainforest monkey microbiomes harbor many more microbial species. These are the black, high, and steep lines that you see in the graph, while those in semi-deciduous forests and fragments um, do not. So what we're seeing um, are the, is the quantity of DNA that we're reading. So this is just what we can read from the DNA that's coming out of the sequencing machines. And then we're making a decision about the microbial species that are present. If you have 97% similar sequences, we put you in the same uh, bin. And what we can see is that the rainforest monkeys have many, many more microbial uh, species in their guts, whereas the, the animals that are, are in habitats that are probably not as good have many fewer microbial species in their guts. In fact, in this group, uh, all of the captive animals uh, died, and you might see why in uh, just a minute. Um, we think, therefore, that there are some very important correlations uh, between habitat quality and microbiome that might be very important in primate conservation and may give us some insights into human evolution because we are fundamentally talking about habitat changes. Let me take another look at this. This is another view of what we were just talking about, our rainforest, our fragments, our semi-deciduous, and then our captives. We could look at this graph as kind of a map of four different cities. Each city has a number of neighborhoods in it, and these neighborhoods are composed of related uh, microbial taxa. So there's a blue 
uh, family group, if you will. There's a, there's a group of related people or microbes living in a neighborhood in each one of these cities. And you can see that in this particular city, we have lots and lots of neighborhoods. Some of these are very densely occupied, and there are close interactions among them. The lines are showing interactions among these microbial taxa. Some are more like the suburbs, where you have very sparsely occupied parts of the city where, where there's not much interaction. As habitat quality, in some ways, goes down, we can see that neighborhoods are entirely lost in the animals that are in a less desirable habitat. And by the time we start looking at the captive habitat, we can see what are probably fundamental changes to that city. Only the most densely populated um, neighborhood remains. Pretty much everything else is gone. We think this could be very important as a tool for understanding the overall health of the microbiome more generally. Let's take a, a brief look at humans in comparative perspective. And I'll go back to what we were talking about, taxonomy and metagenomics here. Now, I'm oversimplifying a lot, um, but what we think we're seeing are some fairly substantial differences between human and non-human primate microbiomes. Here we're looking at something a little different. We're looking at the 50 most common bacterial phyla along the x-axis, and then we're looking at a count um, of how often they're present along the y-axis. And what you can see with the human microbiome, including infants and adults, is kind of a lazy L-shape to that curve. The first three or four bacterial phyla are present in very high abundance, and then it drops off quite, radi quite significantly thereafter, and then becomes quite, quite trivial in the case of infants. And that makes sense. Infants are born uh, uh, with, without microbiomes. They acquire them from the environment. We think that there are some important differences between the human microbiome and the non-human microbiome, and that we don't see that kind of lazy L curve to the, to the non-human primate taxon. Again, this is more complicated than I'm uh, presenting it but it could suggest some fairly important reorganizations of human uh, microbiomes. I hope this slide isn't too complicated, but if anyone has socks that look like this, I want to photograph. This is, these are results that, that tell us about metagenome function or genome function in the microbial populations. Now, the tool that we're using um, gives us information about 28 primary functions. These are two of the functions. These are two of the three most important um, functions that we, uh, that we can identify. So let me walk this through you. What we're saying here is that this blue howler monkey, each bar is an individual animal, the blue howler monkey is conducting uh, probably a little more than 10 percent, maybe 11 percent of the genes that we can pull out of the microbiome are dedicated to protein metabolism. When we drill down into this, what we find is that most of that is, um, is protein biosynthesis. So, what we're saying is that over 10 percent of the genes in the microbes from non-human primates are devoted towards manufacturing protein. As you can see in humans down here, uh, it looks like less than 10 percent of the total genome from the microbes is involved in, in protein biosynthesis. So we think there's a difference between non-human and human primates in terms of uh, actually making uh, proteins. The pattern is um, reversed when we start looking at carbohydrates. And here again, our first blue howler, uh, and then humans, we can see that processes or genes that have something to do with carbohydrate processing are a little less common in uh, non-human primates, but they're more common in humans um, in, in this particular example. And again, we're talking about 28 uh, of general functions here, so uh, if these were allocated simply randomly, we'd be talking about 3 percent gene function. So there, this is a substantial portion, we think, of the microbial genome that's dedicated to um, these particular functions. So let's try to round things out um, and think about what we have. I think we're finding dynamic relations between primates and their gut microbiomes. We can't just take one gut microbiome and put it into all different primate species. There's important variation here that we need uh, to know about, and I think our howler monkeys are saying um, very clearly that this is a dynamic relation. We're actually quite worried about this from a conservation perspective because it looks like when the external habitat starts crashing, so does the internal habitat. And I want to publicly congratulate Ms. Ms. Amato for looking at this and, and having so much to worry about, not only external but internal ecosystems. We think that human microbiomes are distinct um, from those of non-human primate microbiomes. This seems to be the case taxonomically where we don't have microbiomes that are as rich and diverse as those of non-human primate species. And it looks like there are functional differences as well with the human microbiome conducting a little less protein metabolism, but more carbohydrate processing. Now, what are the implications for human evolution? 
I think we can expect that microbiomes change with diets across the course of uh, human uh, evolution. Of course, unfortunately, as far as I can tell, we can't directly get those microbes out, but it's something to think about when we talk about climate change, diet change, and so on and so forth. And the howlers may give us some guidance on that issue as well as other species that we're looking at. at. The taxonomic data seem to be showing some significant reorganization of the human microbiome. We might be thinking about a release from protein metabolism. We're asking how important are microbes for brain evolution, and our large-scale comparative analyses will be addressing that. So what are some next steps? We're very interested in documenting additional covariation between microbes, habitats, and primate morphologies, particularly brain sizes. And as our comparative studies develop, we'll be able to look at that more carefully. We're extremely interested in B vitamins, and I haven't talked about those uh, very much here today, but, but we're looking closely at those, particularly in terms of the functional data that we talked about, and we're also interested in looking at protein metabolism versus, um, versus brain size in primates. Uh, I have a lot of people to thank. I'd, again, like to thank Ms. Uh, Amato for uh, excellent work, as well as our postdoc, Carl Yeoman, um, who has been a remarkable part of this project, as well as a number of collaborators and the National Science Foundation. Thank you very much.